Russia queuing up behind him, another TBM right. At the moment, what is happening is each team is trying to come to the front. They're trying to use all of their power to control the main field, but they have started a little bit too soon. They lose a little bit of energy, they lose a bit of power, go back into the main field and try and recuperate. Well, even of a young professional rider who picked up the national championship in Russia just a week before this race began, uh, taking over from Vyacheslav Ekimov, who rides here on the US Postal team. We haven't seen too much of uh, Slava yet, but I think we will. As the field continue now to fly for the corners here and try and keep the men at the head of the bunch. This is not a moment for the nervous now. Those riders not interested will slip slowly to the back of this big field. But remember, to get the same time as the rider who wins the stage, you must stay in the big field as well. Otherwise, the clock will give you a separate time and the race favourites always wary of that in case the race splits up in the last kilometre or so. TVM, though, I think, Paul, today, and they're trying to keep the action. If we go under the last kilometre here, are looking and hoping that Jerome Blyleben will finish it off for them today. Well, even off did a very hard turn there. He's disappeared from the front now, just leaving one final TBM rider who, in fact, has slipped just a little bit off the front there. Not great organisation. Now it's the GAN team taking over. Eros Poli on the front in second position behind him is Magnus Baxter. In third place, you can be sure, is going to be the shape of Frederic Moncassin. So maybe Moncassin will turn it around for GAN this afternoon. First place across the line will give him the yellow jersey, but Zabel's there. Zabel is there, and Tom Steele is here too, wearing the green jersey today, and not his national Championship of Belgian colours, so you can see uh, Steele's hunting for the second win. Moncassin in a great place at the moment. Second wheel in the bunch as they come for the line. But this could be Zanini now leading out. Watch out for Zanini well in that polka dot jersey. A good sprinter. This again is a battle of the sprinters now. Moncassin coming to the right of our picture now. Up on the inside comes Cipollini. Watch the left and the right. It looks like Van Haeft is having a go too. This is going to be a tight finish now as they dig for the line. Zabel is going to try and take it on the line. But as they come up towards the line, it's going to be a win for Jan. Zverada, the champion of the Czech Republic, he has absolutely pulled the eyes over everybody and Zerada comes out of the pack and takes the stage, steals the glory and I'll have to wait and tell you who got the places and then I might be able to tell you who is now the new leader of the Tour de France. Well, let's have a look at the sprint again now. This was really a superb finish. There's Jan Zerada lying second at the moment. The polka dot jersey of Zanini trying to creep through and attacked there by Paul van Heeft of the Lotto team, and then the riders started to wind up for the finish, and the rider from the Rabobank was Robbie McEwen, the Australian, who finished third yesterday. He's the orange half colours there, now second in the line, but they couldn't get onto the back wheel of Jan Zerada here, and none of them. Cipollini coming with a late run, showing us the speed he has in those legs, but it will be second for McEwen and third for Mario Cipollini. Tom Steele was somewhere in there, but for my money now, the new leader of the Tour de France will be Eric Zabel of Germany. There's the face of Jan Zerada. And he made it look easy, but the fact was he timed his sprint to absolute perfection. And that's the way it proved, but first the stage result with Jan Zerada edging out Robbie McEwen and Mario Cipollini. Tom Steele's finished fifth and outside of the win bonuses. Well, yesterday the Belgian champion, and today the Czech Republic title holder. Zerada read the sprint to perfection. The overall situation, Eric Zabel ends the day in the race lead, ahead of Tom Steeles and Frederick Moncassan. Jan Zerada comes up into ninth place. Well, he's won the green jersey twice overall. Now Eric Zabel has a leader's yellow jersey as well as a souvenir. He'll defend that tomorrow in France. Sadly, however, Zabel's leadership is today overshadowed by the crash at Yall, which took Chris Boardman out of the Tour de France and into Cork's University Hospital. A touch of wheels and a promising tour for him has ended here in Ireland. And indeed, for everyone now, the Tour de France has ended in Ireland. And by the way, tomorrow have your pens and paper ready because we'll give you details of our competition. And don't forget, for the full results, you can see us on our website, which is sport.channel4.com. Well, tomorrow night our programme will come to you at 6 o'clock from Lorient in France. The riders are now going home, but my goodness me, the Irish did a great job in looking after this race. Until tomorrow, goodbye.
The official Channel 4 guide to the 1998 Tour de France is out there. Sport on 4 with Volkswagen Chiran. Puts you where no one else does. Chris Bourbon's affair with the Tour de France has again ended abruptly. The race leader down and out after touching a wheel and crashing at 35 miles an hour on yesterday's final stage of the race in Ireland. Taken to Cork Hospital, Bourbon's injuries were less serious than feared, but they did include a fractured wrist and facial injury. But the race goes on, and it's now advantage Germany as Eric Zabel wears the yellow jersey for the first time in his career. He heads the overall standings in front of Tom Steele and Frenchman of Fred Moncassin. Among others, yesterday's winner Jan Zarada is ninth. For the moment, the sprinters rule OK, and the race lead could find another pair of shoulders today when it goes to Lorient. So, after a memorable tour in Ireland, this is Roscoff in Brittany, and like Ireland, playing host to the tour for the very first time. Last night, the riders transferring in comparative luxury on three chartered aircraft the flight taking a little more than an hour. The Tour de France organizers saying this was the biggest logistical exercise they'd ever undertaken, but they succeeded. For the rest of the Tour family, though, it was a long sea crossing on three specially chartered Stennis ships. And Gary Imlach will update us on that a little later in the program. And with the good news that Chris Bourbon has been discharged from hospital today, the 186 riders now without him, Eric Decker, who was injured in Phoenix Park, and a sick Ludovic Auger, move away from Roscoff at 1.40. The French no doubt conscious of the fact that today is Bastille Day, and a stage win will be very nice. Well, also injured near Yorl yesterday was an 11-year-old child when she was hit by a rider. She remains in intensive care with a fractured skull, and we sincerely hope she'll make an early recovery. And Chris Bourbon, by the way, as he left Cork Hospital, also passed on his very best wishes to her. Eric Zabel is now the leader, and today becomes only the 10th German to wear the Maillot Jaune since Kurt Steupel began the trend back in 1932. Excellent racing conditions for the riders with a cloudy afternoon, but mainly sunny in the latter part of the race. The wind coming from the northwest, 30 kilometers an hour along the latter part of the course. And the riders this afternoon will be looking at a slightly warmer day's racing with 20 degrees Celsius the maximum. And the pace a little better than warm. Paul, in fact, hot, I think, because they've left Roscoff at quite a canter. And as we come up to the sprint of Kamana, 39 kilometers under the wheels, Bo Hamburger of Denmark just clear of the field to take the six seconds time bonus. And the rider down there going across in second place, wearing the rainbow jersey of world champion, is Laurent Brochard. He gets four seconds. And Bo Hamburger, very frisky today, starting the move that has established itself quite a lead now. And Plonave, a lead of four and a half minutes for nine riders. Stuart O'Grady taking them over the line, ahead of George Hinkapi of the US Postal Team. And Bo Hamburger there again in third place. Well, one man in the Tour de France this week has already had a great time. It's the Aussie, Robin McEwen. He's had a second and a third so far. Well, try and go 3-2-1, but uh, it's always going to be difficult. But, um, yeah, yesterday it was a, a strange finish. Like, at 11 kilometres ago, I was in the crash, laying on the ground. And then, uh, yeah, then I got back up in the front and ended up second on the stage. So you really never know what's going to happen, but I just keep trying like I had the last two days. Uh, do the same thing and hope for a better result. Good luck for today then. Tough. Cheers then. Well, there's the view of the peloton from the helicopter now, and as you can see by the riders at the back of the bunch, this race is now wide open and red hot. These riders are in pursuit of nine men who broke away at 45 kilometres. They've built a lead of seven minutes. 
They include Stuart O'Grady of the GAN team trying to get the yellow jersey back on that squad after the demise of Chris Borman yesterday. The American champion George Hincapi and Bo Hamburger who rides for the casino team. Those are the three riders most likely to profit by this escape. At the moment, the yellow jersey on the road is Hamburger, followed by O'Grady and Hincapie, and a blanket would cover the difference between the three of them. It's only a couple of seconds. But the gap, Paul, as I say, at one stage was over seven minutes. It is now down to just a shade over five. That has come down even more rapidly. It's down by the race radio being announced as four minutes and 17 seconds as we come now into the town of moliens sur mer for the third sprint of the day and an important sprint indeed for George Hincapie and Stuart O'Grady because they will want to try and get the maximum points in case this breakaway can stay clear till the finish. This is going to be an interesting thousand metres here. In the last sprint we had, O'Grady beat Hincapie and Hamburger. Hamburger is not a bad sprinter, although we often think about him as a climber. And Hamburger is trying to spoil the party here and go off the front of the group. Now O'Grady is going to have to make a decision. Sensible move by a Hamburger there. He realised these two other riders would be marking each other very much. And in fact, George Hincap is being caught out. And Bo Hamburger's gone off the road. And he's being nailed right back there by Stuart O'Grady. And Bev ever vigilant, wearing number 14, Pascal Hervé. But they brought back the Dane. And I would think this one must surely go to O'Grady now. Well, that's a perfect move by the former double world track champion, Stuart O'Grady. He's got three Olympic medals in his pocket as well. He can sprint very quickly indeed. He's making Hamburger continue with the attack. The Breton flags are waving as they come up towards the line now. This is going to be a tough finish here, but O'Grady could well snatch the six seconds if he can come out of the slip. In fact, he made no effort to come out. He allowed Hamburger to take it. O'Grady gets the second place sprint. And the third place it will go to Pascal Hervé, who, by the way, has done enough today to become the new leader in the King of the Mountains competition. But that's interesting. O'Grady never finally tried to put home his sprint. I think Hamburger led out the sprint very rapidly indeed. He caught them all by surprise by, in fact, just riding off the front by 10 or 15 lengths there. And they realised then that he'd got a gap and they had to close it down. O'Grady was the man who closed down the gap. But once Hamburger then opened up the sprint, in fact, I think O'Grady was just happy to sit on his wheel. So the breakaway continues now. These nine riders are bound for Lorient town where we first visited with the Tour de France back in 1939 and in 1985 it was the scene of the depart of the tour proper. Well here's Christian Henn uh, leading for the telecom and the Anse giving him a hand as well as they're heading up to the sprint where the leaders have now gone through and the clock is ticking. But I have to say Paul that Bo Hamburger did well there because they still have a lead of around about two two and a half kilometers over the main field now the question is, can they survive to the finish? I don't think they can now, it's 3 minutes 48 seconds and there are four very strong teams at the front of the main field working to try and pull them back. The Onse squad have been sent up by Laurent Jalabert, the Rico Scotti squad from Italy there in the blue jerseys, they've come up as well to, to stir it up, but of course the big power driving coming from the Team Telecom in the pink jerseys for Eric Zabel, the leader of the tour so far. So the time gap is down to 3.48, the gap has now been halved, the biggest gap coming at uh, 63 miles, around about 102 kilometres, and we now are approaching the 135 kilometre point, so they have brought that lead down very quickly indeed. O'Grady at the moment is lying second in the overall classification now, three seconds behind Hamburger, George Hincapie is third, ten seconds behind Hamburger, and of course that's plus all the gains over the main field, of actual time on the road. That's the way it would appear at the finish uh, if these other boys can get up to them. So this is the escape now and still the two boys, the red shorts on of Casino, try to keep this race away. So too George Hincapi. There's the new leader in the King of the Mountains, Pascal Hervé. And the gap now is down to 2 minutes 40. This is going to be some finish. We'll take a break. Bonjour, je suis Laurent Chalabert, vous suivez le Tour de France sur Channel 4. So, she wants 20 million, the penthouse, the chalet, the cottage and the villa, the silver, the china and the art. She wants the kids, the horses, because as far as your friends go, she wants the Robinsons, the Belfers, the Goldsteins and the Schmeldricks. Nice mix. <laughs> oh, but you can have the maid. Again. 
and uh, she gets the car. Mm -hmm. Twin airbags, ABS, automatic transmission, air conditioning, and a three-year warranty. The Chrysler Neon, built for the most demanding country in the world. In a recent poll, Sainsbury shoppers were asked to vote for the things they'd like to see more of in Sainsbury's. Top of the poll, more organic products. Well, what happened? Organic lines up to 118. That's a 100% swing. Next, shoppers wanted more lower-fat items. Over 40 added. More vegetarian frozen meals. An increase of 40%. The significant thing is, you voted, they listened. Yes, Mrs. Clark, they did get your organic bananas. Can you guess how much Vodafone's new local off-peak call rate is for both evenings and weekends? Just 2p a minute. For cheaper local off-peak calls, the word is Vodafone. This is Ronsil Quick Drying Wood Stain. It's a wood stain from Ronsil that's quick drying. It protects your wood and is rainproof in about 30 minutes, which means in about 30 minutes your wood is rainproof and protected. So if you want your wood stain to dry quickly, use Ronsil Quick Drying Wood Stain. It does exactly what it says on the tin. Japan's legendary Kodo drummers with the Doma Lunny Band. July 14th, RDS, at the Guinness Global Gathering. Tickets from usual outlets. I'm going to ride the Tour de France and I hope you're going to watch on Channel 4 to see me in the sprints. Now as you saw at the top of the show, the riders flew back to France last night, but the rest of the tour had more baggage than would fit in the overhead locker or the seat in front of us, so we had to take the scenic route. As soon as yesterday's stage was finished, everyone started getting ready, making sure we left the place clean and tidy, getting into going away outfits and turning the place upside down looking for the continental plug adapters. What have you got in this suitcase? Bricks? Well, funny you should ask, because the tour is an event that travels with everything, including several kitchen sinks, its own toilets, and dozens of breeze blocks to make sure the Coventry Tribune doesn't blow over. Of course, the tour goes through this routine after every stage, the difference being that yesterday, everyone was working to a deadline. Oh, we've got a boat to catch. <laughs> Precisely. Three ferries, in fact, to accommodate four and a half kilometres of tour vehicles. Everything from the broom wagon to the ambulance that had taken Chris Boardman to hospital that afternoon. Bringing up the rear were the giant lorries that carry the tour's vital infrastructure. And to the tune of Amazing Grace, an Irish marching band on the quayside performed the ceremonial piping aboard of the Portaloos. Already on board to reply for the French was a Celtic band from Lorient. And as the guard are headed home after three days of sterling work, they charmed the ferry door shut, then played us out. And that was it. Or so we thought, but the Irish had one final flourish in reserve, and as we passed the promenade at Cork, they produced it. Of course, once we hit France 16 hours later, the whole race had to be put back together again. But it was a great send-off after a very enjoyable few days in Ireland. And talking of Ireland, Chris Boardman, of course, was still there, having been detained in hospital overnight after the crash that put him out of the race yesterday. The good news was that Chris was discharged from hospital this morning, and before he headed home, he held a press conference. I'm also disappointed. This is now the third time I had to leave the tour because of a crash. So, obviously, it's not a very good record, really. So, I'm hoping it'll, uh, it'll stop here. You know, wake up in an ambulance, OK, this is the situation, and you just, just get on with it. I mean, this is the only way I get a holiday in the summer. You know? The only other holiday I've ever had in the summer in, in, in 10 years bike riding was when I fell off in uh, 1995. So it's a rather extreme way to get a holiday, but um, the beers are set up. I'll sling the hammock up in the garden and, and I will make the most of it for a few days, I can assure you. <laughs> well, Chris has still got his sense of humour. And since that interview, by the way, he's flown home now to Manchester and hopefully he'll recover well enough and perhaps have an attempt at gaining another world title in the track 
in Bordeaux in October. Now back to the action here. There's the man in our picture now in the white, Stuart O'Grady, who's trying today to get the yellow jersey back into the Gan camp. He's lying very close to the new leader on the road, Bo Hamburger. And there is Bo Hamburger, knowing now he could pull on the Mayo Jean if they stay away. But, Paul, the gap is coming down, perhaps not as dramatically as it was a little bit earlier. It started off by being very dramatic. It was seven minutes at one stage. It was cut rapidly down to three minutes, 50 seconds. But over the last 10 or 15 kilometres, the main field having a hard time pulling back time. It's only 15 seconds at, a, at, a, at each time check that we're getting. So it may well be that these seven riders, we're lo these nine riders we're looking at now, have done just enough to hold off the main field. And that's all they need to do. But there are passengers in this breakaway. The wind coming straight in off the sea. It's rather an exposed last few kilometres into Lorient today. Basically, though, it's behind the riders, cross tail. And this maybe is uh, in their favour, I think. But watch out for the opportunist in this breakaway, because as the finish looms up, then we think somebody's going to try and go alone. The crosswinds has split big groups off the peloton now, which is uh, a sign of the pressure being put on at the front by Telecom. And I wonder now if the greyhounds of the day can survive. Bo Hamburger takes up the pace. He's the man with the most to gain at the moment because he's currently leading the Tour de France with a three-second advantage over Stuart O'Grady and George Hincapie just 10 seconds further back. And over the last few moments, the computer is on his bike there on the handlebars has been reading speeds of 48 kilometres an hour. There's the inevitable roundabout, not too far from the finish, and that wonderful picture that I never cease to tire of as the peloton splits and goes both sides and then merges back together, and thankfully they don't bump and collide. Well, O'Grady's constantly been dropping back and talking to his team assistant manager, Serge Boucherie, himself a former champion of France, about the whole situation. We obviously can't hear what they're saying, but judging by the shrugging and pouting, I think the Boucherie, who doesn't speak English, was telling O'Grady about waiting and see if this gets to the finish, rather than bother overly about the small sprint bonuses along the way, because uh, a good victory is very important for the team morale right now, having lost their captain, Chris Borman, with that crash yesterday. It's just a question of survival now. They've ridden and got the big gap that they wanted to. They now know that they're going to survive. The gap over the main field now down to 1 minute and 45 seconds. But for these riders, what's important now is to make sure that nobody gets away on their own. Nobody surprises them with a late attack. However, on one point to note, the casino team have two riders here. So they have the ability to actually maneuver themselves and put themselves into a situation where they can launch a rider into the attack. And that may be why Pascal Chanteur keeps going to the front. He's been the sacrifice for Asul Lam over the last few kilometers to keep the pace high. And you know Bo Hamburg is sitting right at the back. I have indeed a little Bo sitting there on the tail while his teammate is setting the pace at the front. I, I feel very convinced that Bo Hamburger is going to take a flyer. He won't leave it to the sprint, I don't think. The confidence of Hamburger there up against O'Grady and Hincapi is a bit of an awesome task. And look at this now. Now the cat and mouse is starting. Pascal Hervé has had enough of it. He's pulled out the number three wheel, looked over at Cabello and said, come on, close the gap yourself. And if this starts happening, the big field will close in so quickly very dangerous to do that at this stage of the game because over the last few kilometers you can lose an all more all, an awful lot of time but Chanteur has decided he's going to try and keep the pace high but every time it splits up a little bit as they go under three kilometers to go the riders behind don't want to close the gap they're all very tired and they realize now the attack is going to come from Bonesto this is the attack that was waited for this is the attack that we were going to get from somebody and this is Vicente Garcia from Bonesto he's gone away but immediately somebody's reacted behind and that looks like O'Grady. Well, it had to come from Garcia. He has hardly been a driver of this breakaway. He's observed from the back seat for much of it. He's taking a fly. If he won, it would be a terrific surprise for both him and Bernesto. But Stuart O'Grady has been waiting for the move to come. He's quickly marked. Hepner's marked across as well. So we've now got O'Grady and Hepner. Now, Stuart really wants to hide a little bit here and not put himself right on the nose of this because a little bit of an experience in road racing for O'Grady. He tends to do a little bit too much work. But watch out for Hervé going through now on the barriers. Hervé, the man of a moment ago, was trying to re-establish the breakaway, has waited for the confusion and has taken his chance. Now, he actually won a stage of the Giro d'Italia, the Tour of Italy, uh, in a manner like this, but that did finish uphill. It might be a different task here on the flat.
for there's a fresh man in the breakaway with a pink and white jersey of Team Telecom there. Hepner now realises he's been sitting at the back of this break quite a lot now and he's nailed him down, he's pulled him back, he was waiting for these kind of counter-attacks and he does have somebody with him. Three riders now in a front split off the group of nine. Well, this is amazing. We thought somebody would try it. We expected it to come from Bo Hamburger. They're struggling to regroup the nine men here and try again. And Wise moves at the front. He must have another little dig and go for this is Xavier Jean, who's in his first Tour de France. He's been in temporary retirement. He's come out on this team, and it looks as though he's finding his legs now. Well, he has, and so has Hepner, though. Hepner is so rested. He's been sitting at the back. He's been working as the policeman for Team Telecom, and he has the energy still and the acceleration to go with these moves. And this might be the decisive split now, because I'm not sure who is going to take up the chase behind, but the chase should come from the casino team, because they have two men, and it looks as if Pascal Santer again is being asked to close it down. Well, Hepner is another man which must go into the boiling pot. If he gets the 20-second win bonus, it would be crucial to, defi to find out where Hamburger, O'Grady or Hincapie finish, and it could put Hepner in the yellow jersey. And that would be a simple matter of passing it over from his teammate, Eric Zabel. What a major uh, combination of happenings this tour is so far this week. There's Hepner now. He's got himself in the front. He's going to have to decide whether he goes or not shortly. He's got with him Xavier Jean, and that is the big surprise. I really thought his legs had left him behind a few kilometres back, but you see he's French, it's Bastille Day, and all of a sudden they're a thousand metres from the finish. Hepner's very worried, looking over his shoulder all the time. He's not getting any help from Xavier Jean. He's gesticulating with his hand, trying to force the Frenchman to come to the front, because if you don't work with me now, we're going to get caught by this group behind, but the group behind still an awful long way back. All of the work being done by Chanteur, and it looks as if it very, very much is going to go to one of the two riders in the front, unless Chanteur can do something very special. Well, Hepner's decided he's going to have to try and open it up here, so he's going to start going first, the former East German on the telecom team. Jean has got his wheel, he's gritting his teeth and hanging on, the race is coming at him on the far side, but they're not going to pick them up now, they've been outwitted by the move here that came from Jean, picked up by Hepner. Has Hepner got the strength here? I think he might have because he's been a passionate all day, so Telecom are going to take this one out at the end of a long day in the saddle, or are they? Hepner's held off long enough, now if he hooks him, he'll lose, and look at this, Hepner has got it on the line, Jean was desperately close, but my goodness me, Jens Hepner has taken the victory for Telecom, but I do believe that George Hincapie of the United States was best of the rest and got a brilliant third place and we're going to go to count back now on time bonuses to see who is the new leader of the Tour de France at the moment we believe it'll be George Hincapie it'll be a Bo Hamburger with George Hincapie just a couple of seconds back here comes the main field now didn't they cruise in over the last kilometer the gap is now down to a matter of seconds from an enormous seven minutes at midway We've got the Palti boys uh, coming up now as they try to get Greedy up to the finishing line. He's their sprinter. But this has been a day for not the sprinters, funny enough, in the end, with a victory by Jens Hepner. And big Mario has got himself onto the front now. Mario Cipollini leading out Eric Zabel. The Mayo Jean won't know yet his teammates won. As there's now a further run up from the right. And again, it is Jan Zerada who won yesterday, who's showing he still has some speed in those legs as they race up towards the line, but the legs have just clamped down. It was close, and it was very close, but I don't think, indeed, that uh, Cipollini took it on the line, but we await for the official result. Well, Hepner here, he had the fresher legs, but he still wasn't sure just quite what was left in those legs of Xavier Jean, who certainly tried so hard to land at this stage win on Bastille Day for the French. Hepner moved off his line very slightly there, but I don't think there'll be a protest. And in the end, it was the winner, but not by very much. And the photograph confirms here that the Italian Fabrizio Guidi finishing 10th and best of the field. Well, first Tom Steeles comes back from a 1997 disqualification to win in Ireland. Today, Jens Hepner can wipe out these memories at Dijon when he was disqualified along with Bart Voskamp after a switching incident when they were fighting out first position. Hepner profited from the freshest legs today and toyed with Xavier Jean in the end for his first ever stage win in seven Tours de France. On the telecom team, you know, they talk of recent Ulrich, but so far we've talked about Zabel and now Hepner, who gets his first win of the season.
He finished ahead of Jean, while George Hincapi was third, Hamburger fourth, and Stuart O'Grady fifth. The main field was a minute and ten seconds behind in the end. So, for the third time in as many days, the yellow jersey changes. Now it's Bo Hamburger's turn. His best ever finish in a tour is 13th overall in Paris, and that came in 1996. He now leads George Hincapi by two seconds and O'Grady by three. Hepner climbs up to fourth, while Zabel falls back to tenth as the time gaps begin to open lower down. And it wasn't quite the result that Eric Zabel had hoped he would bring to his wife today. Pascal Hervé gave the Trouble Festina team a leader in the King of the Mountains competition, but the team continues under a cloud of suspicion as their arrested team masseur, Willy Voigt, said today from his Lille prison that the drugs found in his possession were being carried by him to the team under instruction from the team direction. This was the answer when we tried to confirm Voigt's comments. The door of the team bus firmly closed to our cameras. Well, I'm sure we're going to hear more about that over the next few days. Well, now it's time for our competition. Pens and paper at the ready. So, qu'est-ce qui se passe ensuite? What happens next? Did the rider, when we put the brakes on the action, A, hit an oncoming car, B, crash into the hot dog stand, or was it C, did his front wheel fall off? Give us your choice by calling us on 0891 114400 and the calls cost 50 pence per minute. The prize, courtesy of Volkswagen, is a racing bicycle, coloured yellow, of course. Other prizes for the runners-up will include the life story of Stephen Roach on video. And in addition this year, every right answer goes into the hat in the final week. And the lucky one that comes out will join us on the Champs-Élysées for the finish of the tour on August the 2nd. Don't forget, pay us a visit on our website. Here comes the address. It is sport.channel4.com. Not only are the full results there, but there's also a few choice comments from me as well. Tomorrow we're back with you at our usual time, 6 o'clock. Until then, goodbye. on four. Mattel came to us with a few concepts, four or five, and we decided we liked Barbie fashion design the best. A four-year-old daughter of one of the vice presidents came up with the idea originally. Her name is E.J. Rifkin. She's now eight or nine years old. Uh, it was about four years ago. So did the kid get a cut? <laughs> Hopefully she's getting a cut. Of her allowance went up and getting a cut of daddy's paycheck. You've had the first ever girl-orientated game blockbuster smash type situation. How different is it when you go out to design a game specifically for girls? Well, we took something that, you know, little girls like to do. Girls use their imagination, and they don't use their imaginations to create war games. Uh -huh. So we had them do what they like to do, dress up. As do we all. The most technically impressive aspect of fashion design is probably the catwalk preview mode. It's a sequence that uses technology loyal Games Master viewers would be familiar with. Of course, no self-respecting digital studio goes without one of these. Yes, your classic baseball hat with ping-pong balls, LA fashion statement there. But coincidentally, these are also used in motion capture technology and digital domain has the greatest in the world. Yes, this is indeed Michael Jackson on his sponsored Weight Watchers tour. It's a scene from his latest video created by Digital Domain's motion capture supremo, Andre Bustanobi. What was the, the biggest problem to get over in the motion capture for Barbie? Uh, probably the main problem was that uh, as a character uh, and, and a, sort of a, a, a toy with uh, rather stylistic proportions in terms <laughs> of her uh, relative to a, a human body, we had to somehow bring in an actress, you know, a model, put the markers on her, and somehow take that and sort of fit it into, uh, into the Barbie model. 
What's the main difference in terms of the problems between the motion capture for Barbie and the motion capture for Michael Jackson stroke skeleton? Uh, it, essentially, they the were the same. It was the same uh, capture technology. But with, uh, with Michael Jackson, a whole different kind of motion. And uh, a heck of a lot more markers because of the nature of the character mm -hmm. and the subtlety of his own motion for the dancing. Well, this high technology was mighty impressive, but personally, I couldn't wait to get the filming over with and enjoy the simpler pleasures in life. Good night, love. OK, I hope you are sitting down, because I know today's show was pretty fantastic. Next week's is going to be even better. And if you watch and don't believe me, then uh, come in and feel free to kick my head in. I will leave you with a question. If Bob Hoskins reckons it's so good to talk, why is he taking out a high court injunction preventing me from getting within 50 feet of the wee guy? Good night. In this age of uncertainty, it's nice to know there's still things like the Games Master webpage. Go on, try it, kids. It might be the last thing you ever do. The Games Master magazine is in the shops now. Price, £2.75. Will Denmark's Beau Hamburger get a grilling? Stage four of the Tour de France is next on four. Evolution isn't just a theory. It's happening right now. The proof is all around us in the living world. Sometimes family resemblances are buried deep in the genes. But sometimes we can trace characteristics from one generation to the next. Improving, evolving, emerging. Sleeker, smarter, more spicy. The new Renault Laguna. Be honest, how many times a day do you have to renew your lipstick? I'm Louise Constat. I specialize in beauty. My last film was The English Patient. How's this for a great idea? Max Factor's self-renew lipstick. Every time you press your lips, it gradually releases color. It's simple. Just press to help freshen the color. Again and again. Take 27. It's almost like reapplying a lip color without having to. How's that for a great idea? Self-renewing lasting color from Max Factor. The makeup of makeup artists. Athletics on four. <laughs> Athletics live on four. You have never seen anything like it. On four with Volkswagen's Passat. It's an obsession. Hello and welcome to our fifth day of coverage of the Tour de France, a race full of drama, excitement and stunning scenery. This is the Breton Coastline. a great day of racing, Bo Hamburger became the third leader of this year's event. He leads breakaway companions George Hincapi and Stuart O'Grady by just a few scant seconds. Further back, the time gaps are beginning to open, with Jan Ulrich still content with his current position overall. And so too is the only British rider left in the race, Max Chandry. This was the scene at the Festina Team Hotel this morning, 
team boss Bruno Roussel confirming he'd not been contacted yet by police but he was expecting to be uh, so contacted although he had nothing to tell them other than how the team functions and for Richard Berenk well he came out full of smiles saying that this seemed to be a film of the summer and he was looking forward now to the next episode so the 186 riders moved out of Plouet for the longest stage of this race, a massive 252 kilometers, with the Pestina team still intact. New leader Bo Hamburger in front at the start and wearing a radio wire so he can talk to his team car today. Ideal racing conditions this afternoon, Phil, because it's cloudy and a hint of sunshine and very unlikely there will rain in the race. A northwesterly wind, 30 kilometres an hour, will still make it very fast because it's all on the tail of the riders and the high temperature, 20 degrees Celsius. Well, the first important sprint of the day coming at 62 kilometres at Plumlek, a famous cycling area, and O'Grady in a mean mood, winning the sprint ahead of Eric Zabel and George Hincapi getting into third place and getting a two-second time bonus. Well, Bo Hamburger in the yellow jersey already in trouble today, just after 62 kilometres. In theory, he is out of the race lead already. And at the second sprint, well, it looks even worse for him now. O'Grady led out by his teammate and that great sprinter, Frederick Moncassan, who moves over and gets O'Grady across the line in first place. So in two sprints, O'Grady has now gained 12 seconds in bonuses. The third place there being taken by Jan Zverada. And on this long stage, here's how the riders take on food at saint Nicolas de redon for the longest day of the Tour. And already, two riders out in front after the sprints of Damien Nazon and Jackie Girard have attacked with a lead now of just on two minutes. So the riders are through the feed and these two riders have escaped. And many of you asked the question, where are we situated during every stage of the Tour de France? Well, we are just on the finishing line which is off to our right here. We're usually about 50 metres before it. And Paul Show and I get all of our information from the monitor, just the same as you at home, from this little magic box here, which keeps us in touch with Radio Tour out on the course. And over to our left here, we have a computer, which tells us almost every kilometre of the way, the little things we may not see on the television. You know, the Tour de France comedy team now is almost as strong as the peloton itself because many of the riders who made their names in the Tour are now serving as television commentators. Just look at this lot here, starting with Bernard Tevenet, a former winner of the Tour de France, and there's Stephen Rux, the first Dutchman ever to win the King of the Mountains title, Roger Pangeon, another winner for France of the Tour. In 1987, it was Stephen Roach for Ireland, and you remember the great battles of Tony Rominger. Well, this is his first year as a commentator when he had that marvellous time in the last couple of years against Miguel Ingerain. Pedro Delgado, who took over from Roach in 1988, and alongside us on our left here is Dag Otto Lauritsen, the Norwegian, who won the stage of the Tour de France in Luz Ardiden uh, when he rode for the 7-Eleven team. So we feel quite honoured to be here. Well, at least it's a more comfortable seat than the riders out here as they come up towards the third sprint of the day now. And these two riders are still away. The last time check was three minutes and ten seconds. And they are picking up quite a tailwind today. Jackie Durand would like to win these six seconds. They might be important by the end of the day. They certainly could be by the time we get down to the finish line here in Cholet. But incredible to know, Phil, the last hour of the race has been covered at 49 and a half kilometers per hour, which is well up near 30 miles an hour. So the speed definitely coming from that tailwind and everybody trying to pull these riders back because they are, in fact, in with a good chance of staying clear. And Nazon is not going to attempt to challenge Duron here. It's not important to Damien Nazon, a six-second bonus, because he's more than five minutes behind the race lead in 173rd position. He will try to help uh, Duron and hope that he can take the stage at the end. So Jackie Duron gets the six-second bonus, Nazon gets four, and it'll be interesting to see what sort of sprint we get for the two remaining seconds on offer today because George Hincapi and Stuart O'Grady and Bo Hamburger really should start to try and pick those two seconds up. They certainly should. I think the GAN team have been riding on the front for the last 10 kilometres or so, and I would expect Stuart O'Grady will go for that sprint second there because it is still very important for him, and he may not well be challenged by the big sprinters like Cipollini and Zabel because they'll be thinking now much more about the sprint finish at the end of the stage. Well, Jackie's pulled off one or two big wins in his career. I must say that uh, he's a rider that really does surprise us at times. The biggest surprise, of course, is when he won the prologue time trial a couple of years ago. 
and it wouldn't have been of course if it hadn't rained heavy for the last starters uh, but he got the yellow jersey and he held it for a few days he's been the most aggressive rider in the Tour de France so far which is why you can see he's wearing the red number on his back competition that has been uh, around for several years but now they've decided to make note of it by giving the most aggressive rider in the Tour de France a different colored number to everyone else in the main field